Hello. In this video, we're going to be discussing the idea of infection control and personal protection as related to uh, OSHA, OSHA requirements. A couple things uh, is OSHA. OSHA stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, OSHA is a federal agency. Uh, the role of OSHA is to protect the American workforce. And so as a result, OSHA has guidelines for every industry that, that we have. So the construction industry has OSHA requirements and the food industry has OSHA requirements and every industry does. And, the, and in medicine, and which includes dentistry, we have OSHA requirements. And the purpose of the OSHA requirements is to protect the workforce uh, from whatever hazards may be related to that particular industry. In our industry, it's going to be uh, bloodborne pathogens or potential bloodborne pathogens. And those pathogens typically we would think to be hepatitis. Uh, we have hepatitis A or B or C, particularly hepatitis B. Uh, we also have to be very mindful of uh, HIV infection, AIDS, uh, because very often uh, patients will be coming in, they'll be HIV positive, but uh, they've never manifested any symptoms, so they don't know they're positive. And so we have to be uh, mindful of that, that uh, these folks coming to us uh, will have uh, potential pathogens about them. Uh, it could be virus, it could be bacteria, it could be fungus. Uh, but basically, the OSHA requirements are designed to keep us free or safe from those pathogens. And so they have established a, a set of guidelines for us, uh, all of us in medicine to follow. Every practice uh, has guidelines to follow. And the guidelines are going to be found in, in uh, what is called the Exposure Control Plan. The Exposure Control Plan is a document, or very often it's a book, that is put together by every practice. The University of Florida College of Dentistry has one. And in that uh, document, in the Exposure Control Plan, which is unique to that particular practice, you're going to find uh, procedures, policies, and practices uh, that everyone is to be compliant with, and by doing so, everyone in the practice would then find themselves to be safe or safer uh, from potential pathogens. Some of the things that we have to be uh, looking for, uh, or that we're going to be talking about, is uh, within the exposure control plan is going to be our work practice controls. That's uh, the formal term for it, work practice controls. But basically those are the things that we do and the things that we don't do in order to uh, minimize risk. The other thing that is found within the exposure control plan are things called engineering controls. Engineering controls are those things that we have at our disposal that will be useful for us, for us to be protected and those are going to be sim simple things such as soap and water, a sink, uh, waterless hand cleaners. Uh, most important that you're going to be dealing with are, are barrier protections. And we're going to be talking quite a bit about barrier protections. But that would, that would uh, include things like your uh, surgical garments, uh, your barriers, the gloves that you wear, the mask that you wear, and the glasses that you wear. And all of these things are part of the uh, barrier protection and those things would be found within the, the exposure control plan uh, as engineering controls. Okay, other kinds of things within engineering controls would be like steam autoclaves, uh, disin uh, disinfecting solutions that we would have to uh, that are available to us. And so, work practice controls are the practices, the things that we do to protect ourselves and engineering controls are the things that we have to use to do uh, to protect ourselves. And so we're going to be talking about each of these in some, some degree uh, of uh, detail because uh, the thing we don't want for you as a volunteer is to find yourself at risk. Uh, none of us want to be at risk and we want to do what we can do for you. Now one thing to be uh, especially mindful of when it comes to protecting yourself, and it is just that, to protect yourself. Ultimately, you have the responsibility to protect yourself from potential bloodborne pathogens. Okay, the school can give you the materials to work with, they can outline the procedures that you're to follow, but the diligence that you have of complying with these uh, requirements are designed for one purpose, and that is to protect you. And so, 
uh, as you learn what to do, as you learn what not to do, uh, take these things seriously because the thing that uh, you don't want is to find yourself with an illness that you contracted by being a part of uh, the dental clinic. Universal precautions. Universal precautions is uh, that, that which you can do, that which you can have in order to minimize risk. And several ideas you have to have in place in your mind. One is, assume that every person coming in the door is infected with something. If you assume they're not infected with anything, you're going to be, uh, tend to be lackadaisical or lax uh, in, your, uh, in your use of these materials and, and practices. But if you assume that if every person walking in the door is contaminated or infected with something and you don't want it, then you will tend to be uh, uh, very diligent about what to do. Uh, to understand that no bodily fluids from another person is to come in contact with you. Okay, now what would bodily fluids be? Well, there's all kinds, but within a dental context, we're going to be talking principally about uh, blood, and we're going to talk about saliva. Uh, on, a, on some occasions, there might be tears. On another occasions, there might be nasal secretions things of this nature, the, the fluids that would be coming out of a person uh, in the head and neck area. So blood, saliva are going to be principal. And uh, another is that uh, for you to be protected, the notion or the concept of a physical barrier between them and you. Remember that bacteria uh, really cannot move on the whole. They are not mobile. They can't move from point A to point B. Viruses cannot do that on their own. Uh, fungus can't do that on their own, in general. So the idea is how does a virus or a bacterium get from point A to point B, from some other person to you? Well, it's got to be carried there. And so if you can create a physical barrier between where it is and where you are, okay, such as from a patient to you, if there's a physical barrier between uh, these two things, between you and the patient, then the chance of getting contaminated with a potential bloodborne pathogen is, is much, much reduced. And this leads to the idea of our personal protective equipment. And, then, and you'll hear it as PPE, personal protective equipment. And this is, and the four things that we typically have uh, in the dental clinic are going to be uh, some kind of a gown to wear. Uh, there's a variety of styles. Uh, the other is uh, our face mask that we wear to cover our, our nose and our mouth our glasses that are going to be covering our eyes, and then uh, the gloves that we wear. And our hands are going to be most likely to be contaminated because that's where our hands are being placed in the patient's mouth. Our hands are touching instruments that are contaminated. And so our gloves are going to be uh, principal to helping us. So at no time in order, uh, excuse me, to, to uh, be in compliance or to have in place the idea of universal precautions, keep in mind that everybody's contaminated and you don't want anything from them to get to you. And the way to do it is diligence on your part and the use of your personal protective equipment. Another concept that I wanted to share with you uh, to help you because, you know, there's no way that you can remember all the rules and regulations. But you can remember a couple of principles. And one principle I want to share is the notion of what is clean and what is unclean. Now, these are just terms that I have chosen to indicate things that you can touch with bare hands and the things that you cannot touch with bare hands. So, what would be clean? Clean are those things that you can touch with your bare hands. They would be things like your computer, your pencils, uh, paperwork, um, doorknobs, uh, anything in the front office, uh, typewriters, or uh, anything along these lines that you can touch with your bare hands. Things that someone who is naive to, to clinical environment and they don't really understand uh, protocol, that they can come into the space and they could touch it, touch these things with their bare hands and feel comfortable to do so. Those we kind of put in the clean category. Unclean. Unclean is a general category or those things that would likely be contaminated uh, with a potential pathogen. And so what would that be? Well, certainly anything that has come in contact with the patient. So that would be instruments, uh, old drapes or, or uh, 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 covers that a patient might have, gloves that you're wearing that uh, have come in contact 
or with the patient if you were wearing your face mask or glasses and maybe there was a splash or a spray of, of uh, some kind of bodily fluid on you, then those things uh, become unclean. And so those things you would not want to touch except if you have gloves on. So if we can understand that it's our responsibility in the clinic to not only protect ourselves, but it is to protect other people who come into the space, come into the clinic, such as, say, a secretary or a, uh, uh, a person who is a delivery person or something like this, who come into the space and they're not familiar with what they're to do and not do. The idea is, is that we keep the clean clean. As you can see here, these are items uh, that are commonly thought to be clean. The inside of the Alabama cart, particularly office supplies, uh, uh, communication devices within the office, things in the storage area such as bottles, also uh, new packaging, and that sort of thing. Things that are unclean though, such as sterilization area, uh, when you're in this kind of space, wear your gloves. Available to us to, uh, to minimize risk, and I wanted to point out a few things that are in that category. First, our personal protective equipment, uh, all of those things are. Uh, uh, the sinks that we have with soap and water, our antimicrobial soaps, the, the brushes that we use for our fingers and things like that, all part of engineering controls. Uh, if we do not have uh, access to a sink, our waterless hand cleaners, uh, waterless hand cleaners should be available at all times. Uh, you never know if there's uh, some kind of a, of a failure in our system uh, that the water doesn't flow and uh, you need to disinfect your hands. So if your water's not flowing, you can't use soap and water, then you use waterless hand cleaners. Uh, paper towels, you notice we don't use uh, cloth towels to wipe our hands with because that's a pathway of contamination from one patient to another through our uh, our washing our hands and so we always use paper towels. The uh, you've seen images or you will you, you'll be seeing images of these things are sharps boxes which is where we put all of our uh, items that have the potential to uh, cut you or and so that would be needles, uh, scalpel blades, uh, things of this nature. The uh, red bags uh, or hazardous waste bags uh, those are going to be the things that we have that are uh, that will store in things like uh, blood-soaked gauze, um, uh, extracted teeth would likely go in there. Uh, if there's if there's gowns that are uh, grossly contaminated with blood or some bodily fluid, those would go in the red bags. The kinds of things that can go into the regular trash are things that are not really uh, soaked, blood-soaked. Uh, and so that's a kind of a distinction that OSHA makes is that in the red bags, if, if an item is blood soaked, it'll go in a red bag, it'll go in biohazardous waste, but if it has just a, a small splatter or something of blood, that that could go into the regular trash. Uh, the, remember that the uh, maintenance staff, the janitorial staff, they too are familiar with what the OSHA requirements are, and they don't work uh, in these environments without their gloves on. And so, uh, so be mindful of what you put into the trash. So uh, no needle uh, or a hypodermic needle or suture needle or the glass vial, the carpules that we've talked about in the previous videos, the carpules, all that sort of thing should go in the sharps boxes because they have the potential to cut somebody or, or uh, poke holes in them. As we close this video, uh, considering uh, concerning ourselves with uh, personal protection, uh, where you're, we're using as a foundation the OSHA requirements uh, through the exposure control plan uh, that we keep in our mind uh, two items. Uh, one is our own personal diligence and responsibility to protect ourselves and our coworkers, and understand that the policies and the procedures that are in place through the exposure control plan are designed to protect us so that we can uh, continue on in our, in our role as, as a worker in some capacity. So OSHA is on our team and so and all the rules and all the regulations are there for our protection. So uh, don't, uh, don't look at that as uh, rules. Rules are made to be broken. No, these rules are made to be uh, complied with and again it's for your safety. Thank you.